Uh, so I just uh, finally figured out how to turn on the um, Canvas course for this class. So if you go on there now, you should see the a little under assignments, a little link where you can download the little Word document that you can use to practice some of these uh, little math problems we're doing. Again, don't do the ones you haven't learned yet, but maybe if we go quick enough today, we might get to the end of all that. So you might be able to actually work on this over the weekend. Uh, and then Monday, we'll just play around a little bit with uh, some of my toys. Um, so any questions from last time, uh, now that you've had a week to think about it? Well, OK, uh, let's make sure we use the right terms here. So a sine wave is really just a single frequency wave. OK, so and that can manifest itself in lots of ways, right? You could hear a sine wave. A sine wave is just a single frequency tone. Uh, so however, one of, one of the, when we use that term, sometimes what we mean is that graph, like this, this, yeah, a graph of a wave that, that is actually a transverse wave that will just do a graph. And that, sometimes we'll call that a sine wave. And I suppose it is in the sense that it is a graph of a single frequency, right? But I just, I just want to kind of make sure what we know what words mean when we use them. Because um, even I will use them interchangeably sometimes, OK? So, Yes, in that particular definition of the thing I draw on the board, yes, that is a type of sine wave. Um, but it is not a picture of sound. It, it is a graph. It is a graph. That's the important thing to remember. It is a graph, a graph of air pressure amplitude. Um, yes, okay. yes, um, which actually is a really interesting, um, that, that plays into what we're going to talk about first today about resonance, um, because what is interesting about square waves and sawtooth waves and triangle waves is that they are not pure tones, right? That is not a single frequency. Um, in reality, what creates those shapes that when you graph that pattern of air pressure amplitude, um, for example, like a violin usually generates a sawtooth wave. Um, and that's just because of the mechanics of how the bow kind of skips along the string, OK? And, uh, but the actual thing that, that makes that, you know, what ha what's happening sound-wise in the air, and if you were trying to recreate that artificially, you're really creating a sawtooth wave using a combination of a lot of sine waves, OK? Uh, and what in the sine waves of various frequencies, they all kind of come together, and they interact with each other, sometimes in destructive ways and sometimes in constructive ways. And that constructive and destructive interaction is what ultimately shapes the wave into this new thing that, if you graph it, looks like this sawtooth um, thing. So. That's, that's the result of the interaction of, in reality, infinite frequencies combining together in a very specific way. Okay? Even though in the case of violin, it's just a matter of that, well, the bow just actually literally grabs and then jumps, grabs and then jumps, grabs and then jumps across the, the string. And then that generates this thing in the air that's, that looks like this, you know, goes up and drops, up and then drops, right? In air pressure amplitude. Okay. Other questions? So uh, the other thing that happens uh, that allows us to hear sound is, is that, um, remember I said last time that we know how, f we know how quickly sound travels in the air. But I kind of made a, a sort of a side comment that sound can travel in other things, not just air. Um, so sound can travel in lots of different things travel in water, can travel in metal, can travel in wood, can propagate in lots of different things. Uh, and we can use that to our advantage. So in the, in the context of what we do, and you'll hear me say this a lot in this class, 
uh, you know, we spend, we'll spend you know, three or four years with you, with you folks trying to teach you how to do a lot of different things, right? We're going to make this thing we call sound seem incredibly complex and detailed and nuanced, and uh, there's a ton of things that you've got to be specialized in everything. But if we take all of that and we distill it down to its just absolute basic level, what do we actually do? We make stuff louder. Right? We make stuff louder. Sometimes we get to create the stuff that we then have to make louder. But in the end, if we don't know how to make it louder, we don't, it doesn't matter, you know. The making it louder part is like the part that we absolutely can't screw up on, right? It doesn't matter. No nothing else we do matters if we don't know how to make it louder. And so all of our technology and all of our tools are all designed and created in a way that allows us to make stuff louder. We don't actually have technology to make stuff quieter. Do you realize that? <laughs> None of our tools make things quieter. They all just make stuff louder. Now, it's yeah, OK, you could pull a fader down, and it'll get quieter. But all you're really doing is, getting, is making it less louder. <laughs> right? <That's, laughs> the, the mixing console isn't making it quieter. The mixing console is making it louder. And you can tell it, I don't want it quite that loud. <laughs> making, make it less louder than that. Right? But we make stuff louder. So there's all sorts of tools and all kinds of science that we've studied and all kinds of things we do. It's all about how do we make stuff louder? One of the ways we make stuff louder is this concept of resonance. Okay? We can utilize the principle of resonance to, resonance to make things louder. And what do I mean by resonance? I mean that because we know that sound can propagate and excite lots of different types of materials, we can use that to our advantage. So uh, for example, sound could propagate in this wood table. Uh, and the way that we would do that, and if we, would, if we were trying to get, try to get sound to propagate really efficiently in this table, we could measure this table. We could figure out how large it is. We could figure out how fast sound travels inside of this particular substance. And we could do that kind of math that we were doing last week of, okay, well, what, would, what is the frequency that would have the wavelength of of the, the, is this, the size of this table for the speed of sound inside of wood, right? If we could figure out what that frequency is, and we could, hang on a second, we can get a thing that could then, like a loudspeaker driver or something that could vibrate this table at that frequency, then this table would vibrate and make that frequency louder because this thing is louder and it would push more air than that little teeny loudspeaker, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, so speed of sound changes. It's a moving target. Um, even changes in air, but it also, it's a different speed, moves different speed through wood, different speed through metal, different speed through water, and that'll affect frequencies and wavelengths, okay? So, uh, so think about musical instruments now, okay? Musical instruments, almost all of them, without exception, utilize some concept of resonance. Think about uh, a guitar, okay? Uh, You've got the thing that you, that you pluck is just the string, but if you took the string off of the box, you would not, it would not be very loud, right? You could stretch that same string out in the middle of the air at the same tension, you could pluck it, and it would, it would vibrate. And it would vibrate the air, but it wouldn't do it very loudly, right? The amplitude of that air pressure change would not be sufficient for us to really hear it. But if you take that same string, stick it on top of that hollow box of a certain size and a certain shape and a certain thickness of material, and when you pluck that string, it vibrates the box. And that box, because that frequency fits inside of that box really well, that frequency throws a little party inside that box, right? And then that party comes out really loud. It's like, hey, I love that sound. Here it comes. And everybody gets to hear it now. That's resonance, okay? And so 
Resonance can happen in lots of different things. This is an example of, re of a string resonating. Okay, so a string of a given length. And you've got the human here, like, swinging it up and down. Okay, and a frequency that resonates is a frequency whose wavelength fits on the string. Right, so I can get one, you know, I've drawn the graph here of a full compression and a full refraction uh, to create a single frequency, and it fits. Oops, it, uh, what did I do? Hang in there. There we go. So it fits inside the length of the string, and that, therefore, it would resonate. If I took this up by 10 hertz, that frequency wouldn't fit as perfectly in this length of string, okay? Uh, however, what, you, what I want you to notice is what this little line means. This is like the wall that I attach the end of the string to, okay? So if, I, if I'm finding a frequency that resonates in this string, in reality, that frequency, the length of the string only represents half of the wavelength because ultimately I'm doing this. I'm pushing it up and it'll push down. Compression, refraction, compression, refraction. Up, down, up, down. So at any moment in time, I'm doing one or the other. I'm either going up or I'm going down, but that is the wave. Up, down, up, down, up, down. So the actual wavelength of the, the frequency that is generated there, that actual wavelength of the frequency is twice as long as the string itself. Okay, because the full frequency, remember frequency is about cycles. How many cycles per second do we do a full compression and a full refraction every second? Okay, and so at any point in time, we're only doing a compression or we're only doing a refraction. So the wavelength of that fundamental frequency that resonates on that string is twice as long as the string itself. Okay? Everybody with me? Did I lose anybody on that? Okay? All right. So here's the thing, though. That is not the only frequency that will resonate on this string. That's just, this is just the lowest frequency that I could make fit or resonate. Take, I could take the same string and I can make lots of frequencies resonate on that string. So, you know, this, this first one, that, this is the lowest one, right? One full compression, one full refraction. Compression, refraction, the full wavelength is twice that long. But I could go an octave up, I could double that frequency, and there's a new frequency that'll fit. It'll just fit in a different way, right? I, I, I could wiggle it so that you'd have compression, refraction, two compressions, two com refractions at the same time inside the same string. Yeah? Wiggle it faster. Yep. You just wiggle it a little bit twice as fast, and this will happen. That's a different frequency, but it still fits. Still resonates on the string. In this case, the wavelength is for this frequency is equal to the length of the string. I could wiggle it a little bit faster, and I could get another frequency to fit inside this string. Uh, now, I have a little experiment if we, on Monday where we'll do this. I have a little string that we can hook up to a little speaker and we can make it do this, okay? So we'll do that on Monday. But if you wanna, if you wanna get a sneak preview of that, there's a video of that on the website for my book, okay? String resonance, you can look for that video. Okay, but I can wiggle it a little bit faster, I get another one that'll fit now. And this time, uh, you know, the wavelength of this particular frequency is, you know, only two-thirds of the width of the string itself, or the length of the string itself. I could wiggle a little bit faster, and I get another one now, right? So you can keep doing that. You keep, as long as you can keep moving that string faster, you'll continue to find higher and higher and higher frequencies that will still fit and resonate on that string. And, that, and if you can make all those things happen at the same time, that's when you start getting these things like sawtooth waves and square waves and triangle waves, and even more complicated waves. My voice is a much more complicated wave than a sawtooth or a square wave. It's, if you were to graph the air pressure fluctuations of my voice, it would just be a mess. It'd be all over the place, okay? And that happens because this also works in air. You can make air resonate inside of enclosed things. 
like pipes or boxes. This room is a box, okay? And I can make my voice resonate in this box. Sometimes really well, sometimes not so well. That's what acoustics is, <laughs> right? Is you can craft a room in such a way to really propagate a human voice really well or maybe real propagate a particular musical instrument really well. There are rooms that are designed for organs to propagate really effectively, uh, and so on and so forth. We have different concert halls on this campus where certain types of instruments and music and certain types of sizes of ensembles resonate and propagate really well in di those different kinds of spaces. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Well, that wouldn't be like 200 hertz, or it'd be 200 hertz on 400, but then right. 400 to 8. Like you're going up an octave. Yep. You're not actually doubling the time. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then would that would be, when you have three, would you be tripling the first number or doubling the second? Like tripling the first number. Yep. Exactly. So uh, the, this, here's an example of how the same phenomenon works inside of something like a pipe, OK? But it's air. So the string is a nice representation because the graph is actually a picture of what actually happens with the string, right? In that particular. But in air, it's different. We know that air pushes and pulls. It doesn't move up and down. So inside of a pipe like this, where it's like open in both ends, what we really have is that pattern of air squishing together, air stretching apart, air squishing, stretching together, air stretching apart. And if we graph that, uh, in reality what's happening inside of this pipe is this. Uh, if you're blowing across this pipe, it's really doing this, okay? Um, if you were to graph the actual air pressure amplitude. We have really high pressure at the edges of the pipe because that's where the air is flipping back and forth on the end there. And the node is really in the center. That's where it's kind of the air molecules are kind of stuck and not moving. So, but just for sake of illustration, what I'm trying to show you is that that is still only half of the full wavelength. Okay, that fundamental frequency that fits in that pipe is still only half of the full wavelength. If we were to graph that that wave, it would have a wavelength that's twice as long as the pipe itself. That would be the lowest frequency that would fit. And then, yes, you could alter the length of the pipe. You could do all kinds of different things to then get other frequencies to fit in there. You could just oscillate that air across the end of the tube a little quicker, and you could get a, a, an octave higher to fit inside of there, right? And you can keep going. Uh, but in the case of a, of a pipe that's open at both ends, or a hallway that's open at both ends, or a room that's open at both ends, or a, you know, a resonator box on a musical instrument that has two holes in it, or whatever it is, then you end up that fundamental frequency, the lowest frequency that you can make resonate in that object, or in that pipe, or in that box, is going to have a wavelength that is twice as long as that object. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, you can go up from there. You can double that and get an octave will fit in there, and triple it, you get another frequency. Yeah? Right. Right. Well, the sh in the case of like a, a cello, that shape, you know, that does, you know, it's sort of that, it looks kind of like this, right? And then there's depth to it as well. And then there's holes that are put in very specific places, right? This is very specifically engineered. I mean, that, that shape is not by accident. It's not just that it's pretty, okay? It's because, okay, there's a certain length. There's a different length there. There's a different length there. The top is usually narrower, so that's, there's a different one there. So you could map all kinds of different places where there's two objects to resonate against, and you can fit any frequency in it. Uh, 
Uh, I, I, I suspect, yes. I'm not an expert in that, but, but yes, I, my understanding is the hole, the shape of the hole is also very specifically cut to allow you know, certain frequencies to resonate in certain ways, right? So that's why that shape is there, because that shape creates lots of different sizes of spaces that lots of different sounds can resonate in. It wouldn't resonate as efficiently, right? It's like some, some sounds would come out really loud and other frequencies would not come out as, as loud, right? So the, so the fact that it's that shape allows it to have really consistent resonance for almost every frequency that you can make vibrate, okay? So, yeah, right? And like this, tech, this is not new technology. I mean, this, is, this was trial and error over thousands of years, okay? Uh, to figure that out, and now that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry, there you go. All right, but the important thing I want you to, t to walk away from this particular slide is this concept of a pipe that's open at both ends. If it's open at both ends, then the lowest, the fundamental resonant frequency, and that's what we're going to work with. We're not going to work with harmonics a whole lot mathematically just because it gets a little dicey, and I'm just trying to drive home basic concepts here. Um, so we're going to stick with fundamental resonant frequencies. And the fundamental resonant frequency of a pipe that's open at both ends is going to have a wavelength that is twice as long as that pipe. That's the part I want you to remember. Yes? Sure. It's resonating. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the, mega, the megaphone is also confining. So it's taking a lot of sound that would normally be going lots of directions and it's making all of that go to a single place as opposed to everywhere, and that helps it go. But yes, there's also some resonance that's going on in there. Uh, okay, now let, what if I change the composition of this pipe a little bit? If I cap one end of it and try to make it resonate instead, look what happens. Again, if I were really to graph this, this I mean, this is for illustrative purposes, but. Um, if I were to graph, graph the actual amplitude, we would really have the node here and the anti-node at the end again. Okay, But again, for illustrative purposes, I'm graphing like this. But the idea is now that fundamental resonant frequency that fits in there is actually has a wavelength that's four times as long as the pipe. Okay, So I, if I just cap it at one end, now a lower frequency resonates. Uh, incidentally, uh, just going back to, uh, if I go back to the slide before, if I capped both ends of the pipe, the same thing would happen and somehow manage to excite air inside of there. It would still be half the wavelength that would resonate. Okay, because at that, that point we'd get anti-node, anti-node. It's still, you know, the, the frequency that resonates has a wavelength twice as long as the pipe. That's your car. <laughs> anybody ever noticed how, anybody got a big subwoofer in your car? Anybody ever tried to do that? Maybe? You ever, have you ever noticed how the subwoofer is always louder outside the car than it is inside the car? You ever wondered why? <laughs> because of this, okay? You are trying to resonate a frequency that needs a bigger car to fit, okay? And so what tends to happen is you open a window and suddenly the sub gets louder. Why? Because you uncapped one of the ends of that pipe and now an octave lower frequency can resonate inside the car. And when you've got all the windows up, then the car is like trying to find, a, you know, that sound is trying to find a way to resonate. And it, it leaks out through all the little cracks and things and finds the air outside the car because that's a bigger space, right? So, but if you open the window, suddenly you hear the sound. It's not because the sound went out of your car and came back in. <laughs> it's just because you changed the resonant, the size of the resonant space in your car, right? By uncapping one end of that pipe. Uh, so, 
again, the bit that I want you to remember in this context is, uh, there we go. If I close it at, w at one end, then the fundamental resonant frequency of that pipe has a wavelength that's four times as long as the pipe. Whereas if it's open at both ends or closed at both ends, that fundamental resonant frequency has a wavelength that's only twice as long as the pipe. Okay? That's the part I want you to remember. You got a question, Nick? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let me, okay, before we do the math, let me, let me demonstrate the concept. I'm going to resonate this room. You ready? Let's see, I might need to. Okay. Yeah, I figured this out ahead of class. So I'm resonating the room now with this, this particular frequency, which is 119 hertz fits inside of this room really nicely. There's a couple of parallel walls somewhere where it fits. So get up and walk around. And what you'll notice is there'll be places where this frequency will be really loud and places where this frequency will be really quiet. What I want you to do is find a spot that's really quiet and then stay there once you find it, okay? That's a quiet spot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've all found a quiet spot. So this is this frequency is 119 hertz or 120 hertz. What would the wavelength of that be in air? Pretty long. What? So what? How long? Thousand divided by. Let's just say a thousand by, divided by a hundred. Thousand divided by hundred is ten, right? So this is going to be a little bit less than ten feet. Look how far apart you guys are. <laughs> okay. So we did it. But here's the other interesting thing: I can make other frequencies resonate inside this room. There's one. Yeah. So now walk around a little bit. You'll hear it come in and out and in and out. So when you're finding that spot that's quiet, that's where you're in the node of the wave, you know, where, there, where there's no high pressure or no low pressure. Yeah, so if you start finding the spot, notice how close together these two are, right there. Because <laughs> they got closer together because the wavelength got shorter, okay? <laughs> there you go. Resonance, right? You can resonate rooms. It's amazing. All right, go ahead and sit down. Now we can do some math. I just wanted to prove to you that I wasn't making this so, up. <laughs> No, it was. That's just about you know. As you it, th remember, this is three-dimensional space. That this is happening. It's not on a flat plane. So even if you go up or down, it's going to change. And you didn't notice that. Um, but you know, as you kind of alter the position of your ears relative to that resonant space, you know, there's also some cancellations and reinforcements that happen between your two ears. And so it's it's a much more complex thing. It's very, it would be impossible to graph all this. So, because what's happening in three-dimensional space is really difficult to capture on a picture on a slide, so you just have to imagine that it's a complicated thing. But in principle, it is resonating, and there's this really weird pattern that's happening up and down, left and right, and uh, forward and backward, and everything that's creating that kind of. It, we, we call that a, um, a standing wave um, or a room mode. Sometimes you'll hear that term, um, and that's just when you find a frequency that just gets stuck in the room. It resonates in the room really nicely. Um, and that means that depending on where you are, it, you, you know, if, it, if it's a frequency that's kind of stuck uh, and you got people spread around, some of them are hearing it better than others are just because of 
where they are in that pattern. Okay. All right, so let's think about this. What is the lowest frequency that will resonate? My thing's Hold on a second. Yeah, lowest frequency that will resonate in a tube or a pipe that is closed at one end. It's four foot long. Okay. So here's the question. If the, if the pipe is one foot long and it's closed at one end, uh, how, how long, what is the wavelength of this frequency we're trying to find out? Four feet, right? Because for a pipe that's closed at one end, that lowest resonant frequency is four times longer than the pipe. Okay? So it'd be one times four, right? So we've got a four foot wavelength. So four foot wavelength is what this frequency is. So if we were to figure out what that frequency would be, we would do speed of sound, which is in our head, 1,000 feet per second, divided by the four feet. And what do we get? 250 hertz. Yeah? There you go. Again, that's not the only frequency that will resonate in this pipe. That's just the lowest frequency that, is, that will resonate. Anything lower than that just won't fit. Okay. Uh, let's see what our next one is here. What is the wavelength on the string of the fundamental resonant frequency of a two-foot piano string? Okay, so piano string over there. Okay. Uh, now I'm not having to calculate the frequency here because actually the frequency is a bit more complicated on something like the piano because uh, the thickness and tension of the string also has a, is a factor there, and that math is quite a bit more complicated. But the wavelength we know, okay? We can figure that out if we know what the frequency is. So uh, we know that the, the, if it's a two-foot piano string, you know how piano strings work? There's the string, and it's attached here, and then it's attached over here, and then, so here it is, and then you get a little hammer that just whacks it. Okay, and then it starts moving. Okay, so how's it going to move? Well, it's it's going to it'll drop down like that, and it'll pop up like that. It'll go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's that's the that'll be that fundamental frequency. So what would the wavelength be? If this is two feet, what's the wavelength of that frequency? Say it. Four feet, right? Twice as long. It's a string. Fundamental frequency will have a wavelength twice as long as the string. Okay. Um, oops, why is that still there? Come back. That's weird. There we go. Okay. So let's try the next one. What is the fundamental frequency of a closed 10 foot long hallway? So, you know, like maybe your dorm, right? So that hallway, you close all the doors, and you try to make a sound happen in there. What's the fundamental frequency? Well, let's try to draw this hallway in cross-section, or a ground plan, I suppose. But uh, So we're saying this is 10 feet. And there will be a frequency that will resonate in there. What will its wavelength be? Well, if it's closed at both ends, this is like a pipe, right? Hallway's like a pipe. So if it's closed at both ends, then you'll have a antinode there, antinode there, and you'll have a node there. There's, there's how it will sort of resonate down that hall. So the fundamental frequency would be twice that long, right? The wavelength would be twice as long as that. So it would be 20 feet. Because remember, the rest of it is going like that. Okay. So in that case, it's 20 foot wavelength. Okay. Here's now. Let's do this with our calculator. What frequency will a two and a half foot organ pipe produce? So an organ pipe is usually closed at one end and open at the other end, usually. Okay. So looks like this. 
And we're saying that is 2.5 feet long, okay? And you excite the air inside that pipe. What is that lowest frequency? How, what would that be? Well, the first thing is we need to find out what the wavelength would be before we can know the frequency. So what would be the wavelength? Open on one side, so it would be four times as long, right? So what's 2.5 times four? 10, right? So if we say times four, it's a 10-foot wavelength. OK, so what frequency has a 10-foot wavelength? That would be 1,000 feet per second divided by 10, which is 100. That's what we did before, 100 hertz. Now you understand why organs have lots of different sizes of pipes. Because every time they make it a little bit longer, the, the, low, the lowest frequency drops down. Every time they make it a little bit shorter, the lowest frequency goes up. Okay, and that way they can make little teeny pipes to do really high frequencies and really long pipes to do really low frequencies. Okay? And when you have like a musical instrument like a flute, for example, uh, when you move the holes and you close or open the holes, you are affecting the sort of acoustic length of that pipe. Every hole you open makes it shorter from an acoustic point of view. Right? If you undo all the holes, then effectively it's only as long as the, the little mouthpiece stem. Right? So you start closing holes, you're effectively making it longer. Okay? All right. Okay, same pipe that was how long? Two and a half feet? So I'm going to say shorten it by six inches, and what frequency will you get? So now it's only, so if we take six inches off of it, how long is it now? Two feet? So now it's only two feet, which means that whatever this frequency is, is going to have a wavelength that's four times as long. So 2 times 4 is 8, so 8 foot wavelength. So using our calculator, that would be 1,130 feet per second divided by 8. What's that? Yeah? Say that again, 1.25 hertz. Anyone else get that? Yes? Anybody else? Yes? Okay. Excellent. One thousand one hundred thirty feet per second is the speed of sound when we're doing it with our calculator. We were using a thousand when we do it in our head. <laughs> okay? Because that's easier in our head. Okay, here's one. Uh, Fundamental frequencies of a room that is 16 foot by 6 foot by 8 foot. What I mean there is if we sort of attempt to represent this room. Um, and then we got, anybody understand what I'm trying to do there? Okay. So uh, what we're saying is that from here to here is 16 feet. From here to here is 8 feet. And from here to here is 6 feet. So we're talking floor to ceiling is one value. Front wall to back wall is another value. Right wall to left wall is another value, right? So those are three different sizes of resonant space. Remember we were talking about the violin, how you know you shape it differently and you can make more frequencies. So this is just a box. You can make three different frequencies resonate fundamentally inside of a box if you just compare the distances between uh, opposing walls, okay? So let's do this 16-foot one first. Like we're assuming no, no doors, no windows, it's all open. So uh, we would do this 16 foot would have a wavelength that is how long? 
32 feet because it would be twice uh, the wavelength would be twice as long. So times two would be 32 feet. Okay. Now, so 32 feet. Okay. So then 1,130 feet per second divided by 32 equals what? That's what I got. Anybody else get that? Okay. Let's do the six foot one. So six foot, again, times two is 12 feet. So 1,130 feet per second divided by 12 feet. What do you get? Yep, 94.167 I got. Anybody else get that? Yeah? By the way, Dan, we would not be able to hear the difference between 94.16 and 94.167, right? <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> we would not hear the difference between those two things, OK? Um, all right, let's do the eight foot one. Um, that would be times two. So now we're at 16 feet, so 1,130 feet per second divided by 16. Yep, 70.625 hertz. That's what I got. Yeah? There you go. We did it. So, if this is in fact a perfect sphere, and that is all the things that are there, are those the only shapes that These are the three lowest ones. Potentially, yeah. So if you if you change the shape of it, then you change the effect of length. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in a practical sense, how would you assign that value to the room? If we were to only use light to find the distance, is that just going to be is that just for the sake of the equation, or how would how would you assign what would be the purpose in finding the, the uh, assigned dimension to a room like that? If well, um, there's not a whole lot. Um, the, the, only, the only scenario where this really comes in, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about super basic concepts here. Okay. Um, you know, we'll, we're going to take this concept and blow it up, you know, to much more complicated stuff later as we go. But where this particular situation is, is that comes into play is when you end up with a room mode like that, like we just heard, where you've got a frequency that's getting stuck like that, and maybe you don't want that. And so you're trying to figure out, well, where's it getting stuck? Right? Again, what, which two walls are making this happen? And if you can alter the properties of one of those walls and either move it a little bit, change what it's made of so it doesn't, you know, absorbs more efficiently, or there's lots of things you can do to kind of stop that from happening or, or, or lessen that effect. It's just a way of sort of saying, well, where would that be happening? Let me just look at this room. Uh, well, okay. That, these two walls look like they're about as long as they would need to be to make that frequency get stuck. That's all it is. Okay? But yes, you're right. Not necessarily super practical here. I'm not talking I'm not saying you're gonna spend your career doing this, right? I'm just trying to like drive home some basic concepts here. Okay. We'll get to the we'll get to the real stuff a little bit later. Okay. Everybody with me so far? OK, so let's talk about uh, some other properties of a sound wave. So we've talked about wavelength, we've talked about frequency, we've talked about speed, right? Those are the three, the three properties we've worked with so far. There are two other properties that we haven't talked about yet. One is called amplitude, and the other is called phase. Uh, so amplitude is uh, sort of the extent to which a something is being compressed and the extent to which it is being stretched apart. So if in this sense of our graph, you know, in this first wave, this is, you know, the highest amount of compression, therefore the amplitude is only going that high. But in the second wave, it's going a lot higher because we're compressing the air further. That's called amplitude. This, you know, in the air, this would correspond to us as loudness. Okay, 
So as, your comp as the, the compression and refractions get, get more intense, we, it sounds louder to us. Okay? So amplitude usually corresponds to loudness okay, for us. And so depending on the amplitude, remember, we make stuff louder. So we're always trying to shoot for that higher amplitude. How do we, how do we get the amplitude up? That's, that tends to be our job. Uh, but there's another uh, property of sound that gets in our way of amplitude, or can get in the way of amplitude. We'll talk about it in a second here, but, and that is phase. And when we talk about phase, what we're really talking about is time. So generally speaking, when we, phase is time in the context of sound. And what I mean by phase is, where are we in the phase of this wave? Because this wave has lots of phases. We are in the beginning phase. We are in the compression phase. We are in the refraction phase. We are back to the beginning phase. We are in the middle phase, right? So you, think, you can think of phase as, you know, along the path of time, where are we in this wave? Because it takes time to generate that wave and propagate that wave. So where along that path are we, time-wise? We've talked about distance a lot in the context of wavelength, but now I'm talking about time. Like, how long does that take? How long does it take before we get to the peak of the compression? How long does it take before we get to the peak of the refraction? It's a period of time that that will take, and that's called phase, OK? We, or we call that phase. Now. Uh, in this example here on the bottom right, uh, this is still the same frequency as these other two waves. And it is the same amplitude as these other two waves. But it's starting at a different phase. You see that? Here's the thing. We can't hear phase. OK, this, this wave that's starting out of phase would sound the exact same to us as the wave that starts at, at a different spot. It sounds the same. We cannot hear phase. Because remember that what we hear is the result of a lot of fluctuations over a period of time. So any particular slice of that time is not particularly important to us. Because a single slice in time is not enough information for our ear brain system to interpret that as a sound. Okay. So phase, in and of itself, is not something we can hear. So you might think, well, then why do we care? If it doesn't matter and we can't hear it, then why do we care about it? Any ideas? There you go. So we can't hear phase, but we can hear the results of phase. <laughs> OK. So. Here's what happens. What if we had two different identical sounds that combined in the air at different phases? Well, that could be, there could be a lot of different things that could happen, OK? Um, like this one over here, the top right. If they were combining uh, at some relative phase that was what we call the zero, you think about this in degrees, OK? So a wave is like a circle because it always comes back to where it was in the beginning. So that's a 360 degree cycle, OK? So if it's some, if, if two identical sounds combine in the air at some phase relationship that is like 0, so it could be 0 or it could be 360 degrees or some multiple, but they are combining at a 0 point, then they are effectively pushing on the air at the exact same time. And they are pulling on the air at the exact same time and the exact same speed, or the exact same rate. And therefore, that you've got what happens when you get two things pushing on the same object? You're going to be able to move it farther, right? Just like two people lifting the same object, right? You're going to lift it easier, right? So the amp that that air is going to be compressed more and refracted more. And therefore, amplitude goes up in that case. So you've got two waves pushing on it perfectly in sync. However, if you have the two sounds, the two waves, 
interacting in the air at some multiple of 180 degrees out of phase, then that means one wave is trying to push on the air, and at the exact time the other wave is trying to pull on the air. Right? At the same time and the same rate. Well, if you're trying to push and pull, <laughs> right? If, if, if I grabbed this table and I was trying to push it, and Deanne was sitting here trying to, to, to pull it, the table would not move, right? If we were both, if I was pushing at the same rate she was pulling, it would not move. And the air is no different, <laughs> okay? So you got these two waves that are 180 degrees out of phase, and the air can't oscillate. It can't be compressed and refracted because the, the forces are opposing. So in that case, you won't hear anything. So you're making lots of sound, but it just won't propagate because they're in opposition to each other. And then, of course, there's all kinds of things that will happen in between. So uh, if, they, if they are some sort of 160 or, 120, or 120 degree phase relationship, it's really interesting that they, they combine in a way that does not change the amplitude at all. But the, the resulting wave shifts 60 degrees out of phase, just as a result of that combination. That's, we can't hear that, right? To us, that would just be like, I added the second sound, and it didn't get any louder, right? Yes? It could be. That, 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 can, that kind of thing can happen, for sure. But again, remember, um, an instrument, a musical instrument, is not putting out a sine wave. It's putting out a much more complicated wave than that. It has a lot of different frequencies. What we hear is, OK, they played middle C, but middle C is just the fundamental frequency. But what makes a clarinet sound differently from a flute is the, all the harmonics that came with it. So even though the fundamental might be getting messed around with, the harmonics won't be getting affected by the same, the same way. Okay? So yes, it might sound a little weird, and we'll talk about that in a second here, um, but it's not going to completely go away in that situation. Yeah? So if you have two instruments playing the exact same time, yeah. and you hear that wah, 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 and then it makes the other one, is that phase, or is that just Could be. What it prob it's probably a different frequency. Right, so they're not, they're, they may not both be perfectly in tune, okay. and therefore you're getting a, a shift, but for a different reason, okay. right? It's beca they may be pushing and pulling on the air more or less in phase and more or less the same amplitude, but they're not doing it at the same rate, and therefore it's kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah. I know, um, sorry, I'm going to ask a big part question. It's all right. But I know that there, on, on Stratocaster, the middle pickup is wired in reverse. Is mm -hmm. that So that's, that's not phase, that's polarity. Okay, yeah, yeah. And polarity is different, okay? And that's an important concept, is that polarity is just which direction are we going? Are we pushing or are we pulling? But that is not necessarily phase, okay? I could have two waves, one that's pushing and one that's pulling, but they're not necessarily out of phase, they're just out of polarity. They're starting at the same place, it's just one's going a different direction than the other. That's not a function of time. Right? That's just a function of the direction we decided to go, okay? and that's polarity. So polarity is slightly different. Now polarity, a polarity inversion for a single frequency, for a single pure tone sine wave, an inversion of polarity would be, have the same result as a 180 degree phase shift for a single frequency. But for a complex sound, an inversion of polarity means all the frequencies get inverted. Whereas uh, a phase shift would only be affect certain frequencies. Other frequencies would not be in opposition. Okay. Yeah? So I know that there's been issues often with but if you had two perfect speakers and say like a three speaker, yeah. and you use the exact middle pitch, and then you play the middle pitch that has or a frequency that has a middle pitch that has two peaks, and you get one foot closer to the mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to do that in just a second here. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have a drum kit like that. Yeah. And like you have two mics on the stage, which is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And obviously the mic that they gave to Hendrix was like fine because they had to get a box of drum kits and you know, all the space and stuff. So in that case, it's actually closer to out of polarity because you think of the drum head, the drum head like going down and up and down and up, and you got a mic on the top and a mic on the bottom. Well, the mic on the top, when you hit down, which you would think would be the positive pulse, Right? And, and instead, the mic's going to suck down, which would be a negative pulse on the wire. Right? But then the mic underneath is going to get a positive pulse, as opposed to because it's going to push in. So you got those two mics, and then you mix them together in the console, and yeah, they will cancel each other out. So you have to invert the polarity of one of those mics, unless, you know, or don't mix them together. Right? That is exactly why you have a polarity button. That's why such things exist, is to solve those kinds of problems. Okay? Uh, but those aren't affecting phase, because that's not a time thing. Okay. That's just a matter of the two mics are moving in opposite directions and picking up the same sound. Right? I guess I was thinking of like if you had over and over, if you had in mic two. Yeah. Yes. OK, so in that case, the mic is picked, two, you got two mics picking up the same sound. There's not a polarity difference here. They're just different distances away. Then yes, you mix them together, and they will be out of time and therefore out of phase. And yes, that will generate all kinds of weird interactions like this. Yeah? So phase is like an effect in like logic or foot pedal, or et cetera. I don't, in my experience with it, it's, it's not creating a doubling effect, though. It's just a, it is time based, you have to set a rate, but I don't quite understand. Yeah, so, yeah, so what's happening is it is creating a doubling. Okay. It is exactly what it's doing, it is making a copy of the sound and then combining it with the original out of time, gotcha. right? And, and it'll, it'll just offset it in time by a little bit, which will create all of these complicated phase shifts gotcha. that then when you combine it, that's what happens. So here's, let's take a look at that now. Well, actually, let me, let me sh demonstrate, uh, let me do the, the Max thing first. So uh, here is, Here's my uh, little sine wave that I'm making. I'm going to make another one at the same frequency. There we go. And notice right now they are perfectly in phase. Okay. So they both combine at higher amplitude. This is a higher amplitude wave now. Okay, but let me tweak the phase of this. If I set this to 180 degrees, it cancels out, right? Because now they're in opposition. Where this one's going down, this one's going up, and they're, they're pushing and pulling, opposing to each other. However, as I start to, to take it out of, back into phase, notice how it's slowly coming back in, OK? So what I mean by that is there are, you know, you can be a full fully in phase and get a perfect reinforcement, we call that. Or you can be perfectly out of phase and do a perfect cancellation. Or you can be somewhere in between. And you'll get some cases a little bit louder, or some cases it'll be a little bit quieter. It just kind of depends. See that? That's phase. Phase is doing that as I change the phase. Yes. No, phase does not change amplitude, but amplitude changes as a result of two sounds being combined out of phase. It's not changing the frequency, it just changes the amplitude, but sometimes it will also change the phase. It will change the, fa the resulting phase, right? So if I go back to the slide, you know, these, are, these bottom two are situations where Yes, amp this one, amplitude is changing, but the resulting wave is a different phase than the two source waves. Okay? Same thing here, but in this case, the amplitude is not changing, but the resultant wave is a different phase than the, than the two original waves. Okay? Yeah? Yes? 
it only exists for individual frequencies. It's basically impossible to, well, not, I don't want to say impossible, but the variables involved are so complicated. Like, you know, you've probably seen the spy shows where they're like, oh, I'll hit this little thing that I'll wear in my, sh my shirt and I'll hit the button and it will cancel out all the sound in the room and then we can like not set off the sensors in the bank vault, right? Th that does not work. But uh, <laughs> because as you move around, guess what you're changing? Phase. <laughs> you're moving around, you're changing phase every time you walk and therefore everything changes, right? So that does not work. But, uh, but in, in principle, it theoretically could work if you could control all of those variables. If every time you moved, you could adjust the phase for all the different frequencies accordingly and then keep the polarity intact, yeah, but then in principle, yeah, but in practice, no. Yeah? Is it how um, noise canceling headphones, is that somehow related to phase? Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's polarity, actually. Okay. So what's happening that is there is in noise canceling headphones usually are closed back which means that they're, they're blocking out most of the sound. Like if you just turn them off and just put the headphones on, you don't hear a lot coming out because they're blocking most of the sound. They're closed back, they seal around your ears, and therefore they create this space in between your eardrum and the, the, the loudspeaker inside there. That, that, air, that space of air, they have perfect control over, right? Because they, they have sealed it and they, they have perfect control over it. So, so on the outside of the, of the earphone, there's a little microphone. <laughs> and it's picking up the sound around you. And then it sends that same sound through the loudspeaker out of polarity. So that the extent of that, that, that sound is getting through or under or through the cracks and inside that space that they perfectly control, they're reproducing that same sound out of polarity out of the loudspeaker and they're canceling it out in the air. Okay, But because they control that space and that's not moving, Right? The headphones aren't doing this, right? and you're not shifting them around. There's none of that weird face shifting going on. And so they can create an almost perfect cancellation even for a complex tone, because they can perfectly control all those variables inside that space between your ear and the loudspeaker. Yeah? So is that a much more complicated thing than just having, like, a sensor having, what it's doing is it's just having a mic, and then it's got some of the, the signal it runs through from in to the phase. In principle, no, but in practice, yeah. I mean, try to do it. You'll realize that, you know, trying to, exactly, you know, it's like trying to figure out how, again, you got to get perfect control over all the variables in that space of air between the loudspeaker and your ear. And gaining that perfect control is complicated, okay? The, the materials matter, the shape matters, you know, the, how well it seals around your ear matters, you know, it's like, the quality of that microphone matters. You know, it's like there's a lot that goes into that. Okay? So, hopefully now we kind of understand what happens as a result of phase shifts, right? Each, that same offset in time, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So now let's look at complex sounds, okay? Now, remember I said the answer to every question I ever ask is either going to be comb filtering or it depends. Okay, now you're going to learn what comb filtering means. Comb filtering is when you, remember I said phase is time, right? So, or phase is the result of time. But we can effectively use the terms somewhat interchangeably. So let's have a complex sound. A complex sound, like my voice for example, has all the frequencies. I'm producing almost all of them right now. All of the audible frequencies to some extent in my voice. That's a complex sound. I am not producing a single sine wave. I am producing infinite sine waves right now, okay? So that perfect cancellation or that perfect reinforcement or the things in between happen for individual sine waves, individual frequencies, but I'm creating all of them. So if you offset it, the time, if you make a copy of a sound, offset it in time and then combine it, that same period of time, so here's a period of time, that's that per particular period of time for this particular frequency will result in what? A doubling. It'll reinforce, right? This will get this particular frequency with this particular offset in time. That frequency will get louder. Here's a different frequency, same offset of time. This frequency will will do what? 
cancel out. And then there will be other frequencies for that same period of time that will be something in the middle, right? Maybe get a little bit louder, maybe get a little bit quieter, but not perfectly reinforcing, not perfectly canceling out. If you were to graph that phenomenon, it looks like this. So across the frequency spectrum, this is amplitude on the vertical, frequency on the horizontal. We offset, we take a copy of the sound, offset it in time a little bit, and then combine it, you get some frequencies are canceling out. Other frequencies are getting louder. So here, you know, this is pro the, probably the, the amplitude of the original two sounds. Okay? So in some cases, the sound's getting a little bit louder. In some cases, it's canceling out. In some cases, it's getting louder, canceling out, louder, canceling out, and everything in between. Yes? Well, so um, whatever this offset in time was, uh, this was the first frequency that got a full 180 degrees out of phase. But everything lower than that will, not, will be not quite there to the 180 degrees, and therefore it doesn't get quieter. Those are, those are summing together. Okay? This is just the first frequency that finally lined up, boom, 180 degrees. Yeah, we're not talking about directivity here. Okay. I'm just talking about the wavelength itself, oh, gotcha. right? So if I've got if I've got a really low frequency, something that's got like a 20 foot wavelength, a 180 degree phase shift for that is going to require me to offset it by about 10 milliseconds because it's a foot per millisecond, right? So I've got to do a 10 millisecond offset to fill that up. If I only do five milliseconds, then I'm not going to quite cancel that frequency out. Right? I'm not quite there to that 180 degrees, and therefore it's just going to get louder as a result. But when I get to a frequency that is twice that, it's an octave above, that's the frequency that's going to go into 180 degrees, and it'll cancel out. So there's always that first one that then cancels out. And then from there, you just go on and on and on and on and on. And because of the logarithmic nature of our hearing, they tend to get closer and closer together as you go up the scale. Yeah, so we're going to do that math here in a second, where you'll see how that works. Yeah. No, no. What you're talking about is inverse square law, which we're about two weeks away from. So hold that thought, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about inverse square law in a little bit. Yeah. So they can have the same frequency. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so let me demonstrate what comb filtering sounds like. Are you ready? You want to hear it? Okay, so we're going to get rid of this one. Here's comb filtering. Okay, so uh, what I want you to do is, tr is get up out of your seat and position yourself um, sort of halfway, you know, perfectly in centered between these two loudspeakers, okay? So you, I'm going to make it comb filter in the air. I'm going to comb filter the air right now, okay? So let's see, in the air. Actually, I'm going to do the wire first, okay? Still stay there, okay? Um, so I'm going to comb filter on the wire using pink noise. All right, so I'll go to milliseconds here. I'm going to just offset it by a millisecond. Sorry, on the wire. There we go. OK, so there's the source sound. One millisecond. So what we're getting here is it sounds different now because a bunch of frequencies started getting canceled out, and a bunch of frequencies started getting louder, OK? And. Go two milliseconds, 
sounds different again because now different frequencies are getting canceled out and different frequencies are getting reinforced, okay? But what's interesting about this is it's happening on the wire, which means I'm actually doing this summation inside the computer before it comes out of the loudspeakers. So the same thing's coming out of both loudspeakers right now, okay? That's already comb filtered. So you could walk around and no matter where you walk, it's gonna sound the same, right? Everyone's hearing the comb filter, right? Exact same way, it doesn't change. It only changes when I change the time on the computer because I'm doing it on the wire. Basically, I have two sounds coming into my mixing console. One of them is that one mic is further away and now I'm mixing them together and sending it out of the loudspeaker. And everybody hears something like this, which is awful, okay? Well, that's what flange is. Flange is comb filtering. <laughs> so, all right. So now I'm gonna do it in the air, you ready? So what I mean by the air is, I got the same sound coming out of both loudspeakers, and I'm gonna delay one of them, okay? So this is where you gotta be right in the middle. You ready? You hear it? Yeah, because I'm sweeping the delay. You hear a cancellation's happening, reinforcement's happening. Wonky, right? So if I just do that now, um, actually let me do two. So do this, like start over here and walk across and listen. So as you walk, the relative time is changing, right? The relative time between the two loudspeakers to your ears is changing, and so you're hearing the comb filtering sweep. It goes right? Okay, so I'm doing that with pink noise. Uh, let's do it because it's really easy to hear it with pink noise. Let's do it with music. Okay, so I'm going to do it on the wire first. I'm going to do it in samples now so you can hear a little better. So here's your flange effect. You ready? Right? <laughs> So flange is just a comb filter where the delay is constantly changing, okay? But everybody, everybody hears that, right? No matter where you stand. Yeah, because frequencies are getting canceled out. We go lower and lower and lower, right? The longer the delay, the lower frequency we can get. <laughs> Okay, comb filtering. Now I'm gonna do it in the air. You ready? Let's go stand in the middle. So the same thing, I'm gonna do the one millisecond. So what do you notice this time, as compared to the pink noise? It's not as dramatic of an effect, is it? So why not? Yeah, so a music, is, a music is a much more complicated scenario than pink noise. Pink noise is all the frequencies um, that at equal loudness per octave, okay? So, uh, but with music, it's constantly changing, right? You know, frequencies are shifting around, moving around, some, some are getting louder, some are getting quiet. So it's not a consistent effect. It's still happening just as much as it was happening with the pink noise. You just don't notice it as much because the thing you're hearing is a bit of a moving target, okay? But you can still hear it, okay? Even as you move around, you can still hear it. So uh, you will spend the rest of your professional life fighting this battle. 
okay? Because what are sound systems? What do we do? I mean, we're, this is a class on sound system design. When I talk about designing a sound system, what are we putting in the room? We're going to bring stuff. What are we putting in the room? Loudspeakers, right? And what is a loudspeaker? It's a thing that makes sound, right? And usually, we got the same sound coming out of lots of them. And they're all in different places in the room. And so the audience is sitting there, and they're hearing the same sound coming from lots of different loudspeakers that are hitting them at lots of different times. What happens when you have the same sound hitting the air at a different time? Comb filtering. Welcome to the rest of your life. OK? Is how do I make that not happen, or at least happen in the least noticeable way possible? Yeah. No, you can deal with, there's a lot of ways to deal with that, okay, which we will talk about. But it's the reason why I, I, I joke that the answer to every question I usually ask is either comb filtering or it depends, is because this problem pops up over and over and over and over again the rest of your life. It's like, what's going on? Oh, it's comb filtering. Um, what's, it go, what's going on? Why does that sound weird? It's comb filtering. Because uh, <laughs> comb filtering can happen as a result of a reflection. It could just be the room that's doing it. You could have the sound coming straight from the stage to the ear, bouncing, and then also bouncing off the wall and getting to the ear a slightly different time, comb filtering. Two sounds, same place, different time, comb filter. No, I'm saying comb filter it happens as, as a result of that. And the room is doing that. You're not doing that. The room is doing that. Okay? How, so so you, you're going to get blamed for it, but you didn't do it. <laughs> the room did it for you. So how do you how do you deal with that? We'll talk about all those things, okay? So uh, what we'll do uh, on Monday? Well, I didn't quite get as far as I wanted to, but uh, so we're, we'll actually learn. You can calculate and predict comb filtering. So you can actually predict which frequencies will get canceled out, which ones will get reinforced, given different various scenarios. So we're going to go through all some of those different kind of situations uh, math, and and look at them mathematically and figure out okay what's going to happen. For example, what would happen if I had two singers? each wearing an omnidirectional microphone on their head, and then standing six inches apart from one another. Really weird things happen. And the weird things that happen are comb filtering. Because you got two mics picking up the same sounds, but at a slightly different time. And then what do you do? You put them in a mixing console. You got both, two, both people singing. You push both faders up. You mix them together. Comb filtering on the wire, which means the comb filtering on the wire, everybody hears it. It's the same thing, no matter where they sit. Yeah, because if you put both of them up, they comb filter on the wire, because you got the same voice hitting hitting two different mics at two different times, but at basically the same amplitude. Okay, comb filtering. Sure, why not? Right? Yeah, you can use it. I've used it before. I've done it on purpose sometimes because it's kind of cool, but other times you don't want it. Like in the middle of like the big love song of the musical, <laughs> you don't want their voices going like as they sing. That would kind of take you out of the moment, right? So, <laughs> so how do you sort that out? We'll talk about it. What, and what exactly happens in that kind of situation, right? What exactly happens when you have two loudspeakers hitting the same spot in the audience, but at slightly different distances? What's that going to sound like? So we'll do all that math. We'll learn how to calculate that and predict that, OK? We'll do that on Monday. So when you see those questions on that worksheet, just skip them for now, OK? We'll, we'll talk about it Monday. All right, we're out of time. So no more questions. Save them for Monday. <laughs> Uh, that's called the uh, that, that's a uh, that's just a, a symbol library. Uh, you don't have to make it. I mean, <laughs> you you can just say wavelength. You know. Okay, one second.